and welcome to the Oddity Archive. The show that don't need no education and don't need no thought control, but does like a good dose of dark sarcasm in the classroom. And on that uh, very Floydian note, today's episode, certainly for me personally, is going to be a pretty anti-nostalgic trip back to, as applied, the classroom. Now, uh, let me be perfectly blunt here. I hated school. Whatever nostalgia I hold for my schooling years, I think I can safely say about 99% of that nostalgia is about as far away from school as you could get. But I, I've been known to say this on Archive and cover this sort of stuff before. I do think it's important that every now and then we look at some more anti-nostalgic material and you know keep our nostalgia bubbles from getting too big. But having said that, I think I am going to burst some serious nostalgia bubbles with this episode. As I found out in researching this one, it looks like there's a lot of people out there my age and slightly younger and slightly older, I seem to be kind of in the middle, uh, who hold quite a bit of nostalgia for today's material. And yes, as such, I am expecting a much greater dose of dislikes and angry comments and stuff than usual. But anyway, without further ado, I do have a, a certainly loosely educational twofer lined up for you here. Cable in the Classroom, and the true subject of my ire, Channel One News. Or as I used to call it, Channel Minus One News. Or Channel IQ of One News. Or just reduce it to its own acronym, CON. Now, before I get started here, just a, a quick little note. I am going to conduct a little bit of an experiment with the narrative with today's episode. For all intents and purposes, this is a history lesson episode, but there's enough personal material here that we're going to be kind of ducking in and out of the history lesson. Think of it like ducking out of class to use the bathroom when you really didn't need to. Okay, ready for our field trip? If it's cable in the classroom, it's gonna be awesome. I think just about any American kid with cable TV in the 90s remembers seeing stations plug unsold local advertising time with PSAs for a little thing called cable in the classroom, myself included. Of course, these ads didn't explain the concept, just touted how the cable industry was helping to get more educational programming into the classroom. In other words, it was just a bit of PR. Anyway, as it turned out, anyone with basic cable had access to this self-proclaimed educational miracle. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Way back in the earliest days of CATV, Community Antenna TV, a group known as the National Community Television Association, or NCTA, formed to protest a proposed 8% federal excise tax against CATV operators. After the dust settled on the tax issue, the group continued on, and on, and on, by the time the late 80s rolled around, the NCTA had long since rechristened itself the National Cable Television Association, and had long settled into being just another Washington, D.C.-based lobbyist group. In an effort to stem the continued negative stereotypes about cable TV, you know, endless reruns, cheap original programming, and violent and sexual material, the NCTA joined forces with a handful of basic cable channels to set aside some time for educational content, be it once a day, once a week, once a month, really just kind of whenever. 
As far as getting cable TV into the classroom, participating local cable companies, which wound up being most American cable companies, would offer schools free basic cable hookups, TVs and VCRs not included. Brought to you by United Artists Cable, partners in Cable in the Classroom and contributing to the tools of education. Today's A&D Classroom may be taped solely for instructional use. The basic premise of Cable in the Classroom was simple. While fair use more than applies to classroom use, Cable in the Classroom programming was nonetheless copyright cleared for a set period of time, say one year, for classroom use. Stations would usually air their requisite block of educational programming at a willfully off time, most commonly for a half hour or so, sometime between 3 and 7 a.m. As implied earlier, a teacher or administrator would make a regular old programmed off-air VHS recording and show it in the classroom. Simple as that. The only real catch was that the cable channels didn't make much in the way of new content for cable in the classroom. More often than not, stations aired reruns of long-canceled educational shows. Think Mr. Wizard. Other material ranged from reruns of kids' game shows to reruns of certain episodes of The Twilight Zone to, in later years, reruns of Dora the Explorer. My personal favorite moldy oldies came from the A&E Network, who routinely aired the generically titled A&E Classroom, which often just consisted of ancient 40s and 50s public domain classroom films, just in case your school didn't have the old 16mm reels rotting in a closet somewhere. As far as new material goes, it was mostly one-offs. Rather amusingly, apparently a few of the old MTV news specials were used for cable in the classroom. I can only guess it's the anti-drug ones. Wouldn't it be great if kids had a place where they could solve their problems without adults butting in with their solutions? Go to your room! No dessert! You're grounded! Nickelodeon's got that place. Introducing Kids Court. Let's cherry pick a few shows that aired as part of Cable in the Classroom, shall we? First up is Nickelodeon's Kids Court, which lasted only for the 1988-89 season but was getting rerun, usually as part of Cable in the Classroom, as late as 1994. The show is effectively a takeoff of the People's Court, just swap out small claims court with kids reenacting disputes sent in by viewers. Stuff like, is there any legitimacy to being a class clown? Or is it okay to criticize someone else's work? The show was hosted by comedian Paul Provenza, but he's really just little more than an MC. The judge and jury, all in one, were the studio audience. As one might expect, there was very little legal basis for the case outcomes. If Henry is guilty of writing an unfair review, then vote now. If you think Henry is innocent because he was just doing his job, then vote now. <laughs> All right, congratulations, Henry. You have won the case. The kids' court jury has found you not guilty. Hi, I'm Robin Morelli, your host today on Launchbox. Get ready to blast off. Okay, one more Nickism. This one was known as Launchbox, which was made in tandem with the Astronauts Memorial Foundation and NASA to, as one might expect, teach kids about outer space. Launchbox has the distinction of being Nick's only program meant seemingly expressly for cable in the classroom. 
It's also noteworthy that these episodes are hosted and or feature other Nick personalities, so it's kind of fun to pick them out. Only nine episodes were made, and at a rate of no more than three per year. Launchbox lasted from 1991 to 94, with reruns lasting as late as 2000, according to Wikipedia. So take that with a grain of salt. The first law of motion states that a body at rest stays at rest unless an outside force starts it moving. Is it true or false? True. Way to go, guys. You get the point. You're off to a great start. Well, this is kind of on brand for me. In researching this episode, I think I can safely call my favorite proper cable in the classroom program the Weather Channel's made to order The Weather Classroom, which supposedly ran from 1993 to 2007, but I can't find anything from after 2001. Anyway, also quite on brand for me is my preference towards the earlier episodes, which were anchored by the then regular Weather Channel crew who, in my opinion, do a fine job of giving simple, straightforward lessons on general weather events and cycles without injecting any junk. The later episodes, with the seemingly hired gun crew, try way too hard to be hip and are too shallow and personality driven, which is kind of a problem when it's supposed to be a science lesson. It's the neatest job I could ever think of, and now that I am a meteorologist, it's even better than I ever thought. I can't explain it, it's my little obsession. Watching the sky was just something neat. It's turning up regional climate pattern predictions that are accurate months in advance. Tropical waters rock! Trying to do a show here! Whoa! Somebody needs a little nap! Hi, I'm Chris Elliott. I just want to talk to you about some things you might not know about cable. Have you heard of cable in the classroom? No. It's revolutionizing teaching as we know it. It's giving teachers a whole new way to teach and children a whole new way to learn. There is no real clear-cut date to the end of cable in the classroom. I'm gonna guess as YouTube started to gain ground towards the end of the 2000s, cable in the classroom got replaced more and more with web video and not to mention mass market DVD releases. Around 2010, the NCTA, now rebranded as the National Cable Telecommunications Association, shifted their focus towards digital citizenship. Whatever the hell that is. And they allowed cable in the classroom to just slowly fade away. As close as I can get to a concrete end date would be the most recent snapshot that I was able to dredge up of the Cable in the Classroom webpage via archive.org. July 1st, 2014. Here we are on the road again, telling the world about the wonders of cable. Hi, sorry I'm late. I ran into a little snowstorm. And this, folks, is to illustrate my point about the future. Do you know what you can do with cable television? Chicago Cable wants to be more than just your cable company. And by donating funds for major pay-per-view events, we're able to help organizations who are making a difference. Organizations like the Better Boys Foundation. Chicago Cable is proud to assist the Better Boys Foundation in their endless endeavors to serve the youth of Chicago. It's all about giving something back. That's our goal. Chicago Cable TV, we are more than just your cable company. When I started high school in 2000, uh, yeah, I'm dating myself here, I figured I had made the big time within the realm of the beautiful downtown Aurora School District. Every classroom, and the gym and so on, had its own 19-inch Magnavox TV, which looked like it had come straight out of government surplus, but uh, hey, TV in the classroom. 
Anyway, as it turned out, the TV's primary purpose was to pipe in an in-house AV club made newscast, some basic school announcements, audio only, and this thing called Channel One News, in spite of coming in on Channel Three. Anyway, every morning at homeroom, we would lose the first 20 minutes or so of it to what soon became my time to bash out unfinished homework or just take a nice mid-morning nap. The nadir of this daily slog was the aforementioned Channel One News, which I usually just consolidated into its own acronym, CON, as in condescending, as in what a con job. The hosts always managed to contribute to the condescending presentation with their ever elitist vibe, which as I learned years later might have been a side effect of most of the presenters coming from wealthy and or powerful backgrounds. Anyway, getting back to the whole condescending thing was an overabundance of very stereotypical teen-driven advertising. You mean Paul, the pimple king? <laughs> oh man, nice thing to say about your friend. Oh really? Hey, I like Paul. I just hope he's ordering some Clearasil now. No one's gonna tell you to your face you need Clearasil. Such strong medicine. Only Clearasil guarantees fewer pimples in just five days. Paul? Hey, you wanna join us? television do you watch? Well, a recent study shows the average teen watches around 21 hours of TV each week. For most teens, TV is the main source of information. I really wanted to include some footage from my own high school years, 2000 to 2004, but it all seems to have been conveniently memory hold. The footage, which once existed online, has been wiped off of YouTube and even off of archive.org. And it's a shame, because I really wanted to make sure I wasn't going crazy -er in my old age. Because, for example, as I recall, their coverage on the late 2000 Hanging Chad soap opera, look it up kids, was rather opinion heavy, and their opinion on the validity of that recount seemed to conveniently shift whenever one candidate would pull ahead or fall behind which happened on a near daily basis until that dumpster fire of a recount got put out. Five excruciating weeks later. The Chad was pierced with a hole, but not detached at all. Those were not counted. With the rollout of Cable in the Classroom in 1989, Ted Turner's contribution to the program came from, unsurprisingly, CNN. Specifically, CNN Newsroom, which was subsequently rebranded a couple of times. Anyway, as it turns out, Cable in the Classroom was slightly late to the party on the classroom news front. I can't find any concrete dates, but from what I can deduce, Cable in the Classroom didn't start until the beginning of the 1989-90 school year. CNN Newsroom debuted in... August of 89. The relevance of this being, on March 6th, 1989, five months ahead of CNN, Channel One News launched as a pilot program in a few schools in the, as best as I can gather, northeastern U.S. Channel One was the brainchild of Whittle Communications founder Chris Whittle, who at the time was acting as chairman and publisher of Esquire magazine. That bodes well. Anyway, Whittle's true claim to fame was not so much trying to expand the audience of his media doings, but get them placed in places with a captive audience, like in a doctor's office or on a commercial flight. Now, of course, at the time, very few schools had TVs in every classroom, or even a few rooms for that matter, and as such, this meant that a daily thing like CNN Newsroom was inherently doomed to a very limited audience. Whittle opted to bypass the cable industry entirely and go 100% commercial with his newscast. 
The basic business model was to finance the newscast through advertising and use the proceeds to provide schools with TVs, a satellite receiver, a VCR to record Channel 1 on early every morning, and the appropriate wiring to, if you will, broadcast via closed circuit throughout a school. The basic structure of a normal 10-12 to minute Channel 1 show was as follows. First, two or three minutes of a watered-down, often low or no-context regurgitation of whatever the mainstream media news story of the previous day was, because these things had to be pre-taped the day before. Then, commercials. Usually for junk food, teeny bopper skin products, often for ailments brought on by junk food, military recruitment ads, and the occasional TV spot for the latest album from whatever lame pop or rock artist. The remainder of the show was usually a mishmash of feel-good platitudes, usually via some lame human interest story, interviews with would-be celebs, most of whom never really got all that famous, and at least one more round of ads. I love the commercials. The kids have been paying attention to the commercials. The commercials are really neat. As one might expect, the ultra-commercial nature of Channel One drew criticism from parents' groups and some local school boards and some teachers. The most common criticism was regarding the ads. Some felt that the show was filler and the ads were the real draw. Others didn't like the notion of advertising in the classroom at all. And I can see where both sides were coming from. Anyway, in spite of this, at its peak, Channel One was seen in more than 12,000 schools across the U.S. In spite of this, Channel One was never a huge moneymaker, despite a single ad costing about $200,000 to appear on the show. The overhead costs were just too big. Over Channel One's run, the show's ownership changed hands four times, First to Prime Media in 1994, the people responsible for the old soap opera digests, appropriately. In 2007, the rights kicked over to Alloy Media and Marketing. In 2012, it went to Zelnick Media. And lastly, in 2014, it went to Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. You know, the textbook people. Hi everyone, I'm Emma Roberts from the new movie It's Kind of a Funny Story. Wikipedia claims that a paid ad-free version of Channel One started in 2011, but I have found a big fat zero evidence of that. Instead, it looks like Channel One started shifting gears towards the internet in the late 2000s, particularly YouTube, where it was posted every day for the show's sunset years. Alas, the YouTube channel has since deleted its back catalog. After years of diminishing returns, Channel One quietly folded at the end of the 2017-18 school year. Amusingly enough, Channel One's main competitor, CNN Newsroom, is, as am I making this, still in production, now under the name CNN 10 making it the final surviving remnant of the overall cable-in-the-classroom concept. The one part of it that I least like seeing survive, but am the least surprised by. Officials suspect a case of human-to-human bird flu transmission in an extended family. Callie Collin has more. Seven members of a family in rural Indonesia have died from avian flu. To be blunt, Channel One News was crass, shallow, and vapid. At my nastiest, I'd say it did quite a bit to contribute to the decline of critical thinking skills over the last couple of generations. 
In other words, through their ultra-strained, spoon-fed news, it did more to stymie conversation than encourage it. Having said that, I'd say any negative cultural impact it had wasn't so much evil as it was just a byproduct of the whole enterprise being a short-sighted commercial scheme. One that somehow limped on for 29 years. If you want to know just how pervasive Channel One really is, well, to this day, I still see and hear some of the old Channel Oneers, whether I like it or not. Just among the crew that I was subjected to in high school, just while making this episode, on more than one occasion, I was subjected to Errol Barnett, admittedly quite masterfully, attempting to strip all context out of any story he was given on the CBS Evening Blues, or News. And on a slightly more poetic note, I get lectured about my mental health by Maria Menounos every time I pump gas. Of course, one thing has improved for me since high school. I have slightly more control over my intake of this junk these days. Stop seeking to be mo Well, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when, I promise, I'll cover something that I have at least some affection for. I certainly think my blood pressure is going to need it after this tirade of an episode. We go to our correspondent, Anderson Cooper, who is in Sarajevo. We now go to Anderson, live via satellite. Anderson? I'm Anderson Cooper, Channel One. As you can see all around me, we are in the small town of Midvale, Utah. That's a small town in Sarajevo. <laughs>